Welcome to class, guys. Uh, this is Writing Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020 Brandon Sanderson Lectures. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, you do not need to clap. Um, uh, let me start this class by giving you a little history of why this class exists. Um, so way back when in the 80s, uh, Orson Scott Card was going to teach a creative writing class on campus. Uh, everyone was really excited about it, a bunch of people signed up for it, and then for various reasons he was unable to teach the class. Uh, so a professor at BYU who was a literature professor who liked science fiction started teaching a class on how to write science fiction fantasy so that those people who had signed up would still have a class. It's very popular, people kept taking it, um, it was very exciting uh, for them to have a class about sci-fi fantasy. So this class started like in 85 or something and kept going. Um, I was a student at BYU from 94 to 2000 um, and I didn't end up taking the class until 2000. Um, for various reasons it didn't fit my schedule and in 2000 uh, David Wolverton also known as Dave Farland under his pen name, started teaching the class. Uh, Doc Smith, who had been the professor who was teaching it, he, um, he had medical issues and stepped down from it, and they wanted to get a professional writer to teach it. And when I heard that there was an actual professor, professional writer teaching a class, I was really excited, right? Like, the idea of being able to go and listen to a pro in the field was really interesting to me. I didn't know the half of it. That class was the single most valuable class I took my entire career at BYU. Uh, this is because while my other professors were really good about talking about things like theme um, and you know, finding your inner writing soul and all of this sort of stuff, um, they couldn't really talk about how to build a compelling character. They couldn't talk about here is how you take a plot structure and you adapt it to your own story in a way that is interesting, compelling, and original. Uh, they certainly couldn't talk about what to do when someone actually offers you a contract. Uh, none of this stuff could I get from most of the professors. Now, there are occasionally other professors that teach um, who have experience. I just hadn't been able to take their classes yet. I'm not saying that I'm the only one that can give you this, but I took that class and it changed everything for me. I had already written eight novels at that point. Um, I knew how to you know, put my proverbial shoulder to the wheel and write stories, but I did not know how to refine them and I did not know how to take them out and actually publish them. Dave taught me all of that. Um, Dave eventually retired from teaching and moved off to, uh, to do other works and the class was going to get canceled. Um, and the professor, some of the professors I knew at the time came to me and said, Brandon, will you teach it? At that point, I had sold a book, but had not published the book. So I was very much an unknown quant uh, quantity. But they're like, we don't want the class to get canceled. Will you take it over? That was, uh, that was 2004. Um, and so I took it over, and I've had the class ever since. Um, my career since then has taken off, very fortunately. Um, everything's gone very well, but I haven't been willing to let go of this one class because I feel like this class was, if you can point to a single moment in my career that was the most influential in me actually getting published, it was probably taking this class in uh, 2000, 20 years ago now. And so I thought, it's, it's a resource that I need to make sure keeps happening. So I tried to format it in a way that it would help me as a new writer taking the class. That means we are focused on the nuts and bolts of writing. You can get from other classes great things on how to kind of approach your theme and things like that. We're going to focus on plot, setting, character, and business, right? And we will have two weeks on each of those with some interstitials where I sometimes bring in other writers to talk about things that I'm a little weaker in. Like uh, Mary Robinette Cole is going to be in town and I've asked her if she'll come talk to you about writing short fiction. Um, and things like that. So I try to bring in some people who really know what they're doing uh, to talk about some of the stuff that I'm not quite um, as knowledgeable about. And so the goal is that, like I said, we will use a very nuts and bolts approach. Um, for the purpose of this class, I'm going to pretend that you want to be a professional writer in science fiction and fantasy within the next 10 years. You do not have to have that as your goal. Let's make that very clear, all right? Um, a lot of times in the arts, 
we, how should we say, we have this, this sense that is actually, I think, sometimes detrimental. Um, and I can, I can express this best by, I don't know if any of you writers have had this, um, but you tell your friends, your family, I'm working on a book. And what do they immediately jump to? Is it published? How much is they going to pay you for it, right? Like that is the first thing that people jump to, unless they jump to, oh, you poor soul, you're never going to uh, be employed. Um, I once had that actually after I got published. It was really great. It's one of those things you dream about, right, where you're like, oh, maybe someday I'll be able to actually answer this. And someone did. I was at a party, um, and they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a writer. And they said, oh, so you're unemployed. And I said, I hit the New York Times list last week. <laughs> it was great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it, did, it does happen. That was, yeah. I have to, yeah. Anyway. Um, but you don't have to have as your goal that you want to be a professional writer. You can write because it's good for you. And I really think it is. In our society, like if someone came to me in their 40s, like I am, and they're like, and I'm like, what do you do? They're like, oh, I love to play basketball. I go play every Wednesday. I would not jump to when you're going to play for the NBA. Probably not going to happen to a lot of 40-year-olds who already aren't, you know, like, let's just say, you know, Utah Valley 40-year-old guys are not going off to the NBA. Um, um, but I would think that's great. That's good for you, right? Going and being active and having a hobby, um, going and playing a sport, it's just really good for you. Uh, I sincerely believe that writing stories is the same way. That simply learning to communicate better, learning to take the stories in your head and put them on page, the page in a way that people will find engaging and will connect to emotionally, this is just good for you. So if you're in here because you're like, hey, that sounds like fun, you are totally welcome. If you've never written anything in your life, you are totally welcome. If you were like, thought you were signing up for Chem 107 and you got here and you're like, oh no, I'm surrounded by nerds. You're welcome here, <laughs> right? Um, whatever it is you want to do. If you don't even like sci-fi fantasy, if you want to write literary fiction about you know, boring people going through boring problems, um, <laughs> <laughs> You're totally welcome here, uh, snide marks notwithstanding. Um, no, really, you are absolutely welcome to use this class however it can help you to achieve your own goals. Um, oftentimes, I have people who just love to game. They're GMs. They're like, I want to build better worlds for my, um, my players. Perfectly valid reason to take this class. Um, I am going to pretend during the hour and 15 minutes that I teach this every week that you want to be me in 10 years or less, right? You want to be living full time off of your writing and being very successful at it. I'm going to pretend that's the case because then I can give you all the information you need and then you can take it and pick out the pieces as you want in order, pieces as you want? The pieces that you want in order to make your writing goals happen, whatever they are, okay? Um, I do want to give a shout out to the um, people here who do want to be uh, Brandon Sanderson, um, or you know, a better version of him. <laughs> um, you probably, I don't know if your life has been like, was like mine, uh, you have probably been told many, many times, you can't do that, or um, that doesn't really happen to people. Um, I grew up hearing that from people that I love and who were good intentioned, right? They really were, and they did have good points. Um, my mo mother, whom I love, is an accountant. When I said I want to be a writer, she's like, hmm, maybe you should be a doctor. <laughs> and then you can write on the side, because all those doctors go golfing all the time. You could just go write stories, <laughs> right? Um, and this was not terrible advice, right? But it does get a little disheartening when everyone you tell you want to do this for a living either says, oh, great, where's the money? Or, oh, you poor fool. Um, so I want to tell you something I learned by taking this class. Maybe one of the most important things was just that Dave showed up and said, 
guess what? I'm a professional writer. I was a BYU student in 85, I think he was. He took this class in 85 or 86. And now I'm a full-time professional writer. Him just saying that made me say, oh, wow. It, it can happen, right? And people say it's a one in a million shot. Well, I bet I could add up how many people took that class. And, and then, you know, they would be less than a million people. And Dave made it. Um, when I took Dave's class in 2000, um, uh, there were 20 people in the classroom. Five of us went pro in one level or another, right? Now, uh, some of us went pro as editors. Some of us went pro in that we published short stories in professional fields but never went, earned a full-time living. But um, let's see, I was in that class. Dan Wells was in that class. Peter Alstrom was in that class. Peter went off and became an editor at Tokyo Pop um, and then became a professional editor um, for them, and then I hired him. Uh, Christy was in that class. She is now a prof professional full-time freelance editor. So we have two editors and two writers I know of who went 100% full-time with their writing. And there were several ever others of us who, I, um, who went half-time, which is where I get my fifth person, right? Um, if you look at that and you're like, wow, five out of 20, that's kind of a one in four shot. I don't know. We might be a deviant group, right? Um, but the chances are better than you think they are. The problem is, if you went to, let's say, your um, biochemistry class uh, orientation, and they said, one in four of you is going to be able to get a job in this field, you would probably be skeptical, right? Particularly if they said, which I kind of have to say is, say, judging by my former students, it's really more like one in 20. Um, one in 20 of my students-ish over the years I've taught this have gone full-time pro. Um, so, yeah. If you showed up to law school and they said, yeah, we're going to let one in 20 of you actually be an attorney, you'd be like, ah, uh, no? What, what, what's the point then? Um, so the chances are against you, but they're not one in a million, right? Um, and people who don't go pro that took that class, for instance, I have someone in my writing group. She never went pro. She's writing professional quality work. She is a fantastic writer, but she likes to write a book every three or four years. And publishing them is not as big a drive for her as simply telling her stories because she wants to tell her stories. They're fantastic stories. Um, and it, I'm convinced she will sell one one day um, pretty soon. If that is not a fail state, right? You have to be willing to accept that that's not a fail state. Um, at one point in my career, this was, uh, this was after I'd taken the class, but before I sold, um, I kind of had a come to Jesus moment. I guess I can say that at BYU, right? Um, <laughs> I probably should have come to Jesus before then. Uh, but, you know, metaphorical come to Jesus moment where I, I'm like, what am I doing? At that point, I had written 12 novels, right? Uh, and I had not sold any of them. I kept sending them out to publishers, and I kept getting two responses. Number one, wow, these are long. Uh, number two, can't you just write more like George Martin? Uh, no, that was, that was the, he was the person that was selling right then. Which, these are big, so I don't know why they were complaining about the first one. They were really looking for Joe Abercrombie, right? They were like, where is Joe Abercrombie? We know he's out there somewhere. We want to publish him. Uh, they wanted short, fast-paced, George R. R. Martin uh, style stuff. And they just were rejecting me right and left. Um, I was not making any headway at all. And I thought, huh. Maybe they're right, all the people who, who say, I'm really worried about you, Brandon. My dad would call and be like, son, your mother's really worried. <laughs> yeah. um, and I kind of had to ask myself, I'm like, what, what, is my success, what does my success look like? Uh, what am I willing to accept? Um, and I had to make the call that if I died, let's be optimistic, in my hundreds, right? Um, with like, you know, 150 unpublished manuscripts. Was I okay with that? Was I going to keep doing this as long as, uh, even if I knew I would never get published? And I realized, yeah, I would. I would keep going. Maybe I wouldn't go at the rate I was going, right? I would have to find a real job, um, <laughs> for one thing. Uh, grad school could only delay for so long. Um, but I was going to keep writing, right? I was going to keep telling my stories. And I made the call that I was just going to keep doing this, even if, you know, I eventually never sold anything and never made a living. And that took a 
big weight off of my shoulders where I realized, you know, it is important to be chasing publication. I'm going to tell you guys how to do it. But you should be focusing on the fact that you want to tell these stories, that it's good for you, that this is something you kind of have to do. Um, and not in this sort of mystical way. A lot of writing classes I took would be like, you'll know if you have to be a writer, right? And I hate that <laughs> because um, I feel like writing is good for you. And I don't think there are people who are predestined to be writers and people who aren't. Um, I do think luck plays a lot in, uh, into whether you make it full time. But you can divorce the I have to be professional and make a full time living from the I just like telling stories. And that person, I don't think, I think anyone can decide that. Um, and if you want to tell stories, tell stories. Don't listen to people who say, you must be one of the chosen few. Um, no, tell your stories. Tell them the way you want to tell them. Um, so at the same time, I have to warn you, you might not make it. You might spend the next 20 years of your life writing books and never sell one. It's totally possible. In fact, it's more likely than you becoming me. That said, everyone I've known who stuck with this 10 years or more and has written the books, none of them regret it. Every one of them is like, yeah, that was great. I'm so happy I did it. I'm so happy I kept writing my stories. I'm sad I didn't sell. Yes, of course I am. I want to sell a million copies, Brandon, like you did. Um, uh, but it's good for me. I like it. The stories are great. My, I enjoy them. Um, and maybe someday I'll make it. You can shoot for that at the lowest level success rate, right? I've written my stories. I've gotten better as a writer. I'm proud of what I've written. And maybe I'll make it someday still. Um, keep that in mind, all right? That's my kind of introduction number one to this. Um, the introdu introduction number two is, can you really teach people how to write? Um, that's, that, that's a question, but <laughs> it fits. Can you really teach people to write? This is something I have to ask myself a lot, looking back at my life, my career, taking the class and things like that. What is the role of an instructor? Other than like the most useful thing I think I could probably get do is get up here and say, look, you got to train yourself to write. You got to spend 10 years, write a bunch of different books, work hard at it, write consistently, and that's 90% of what you need to do. That sentence right there will cover it. Um, almost every question you'll have for me in this class, and I'll let you ask questions about what do I do, most of them will, be, will come down to try a few things, practice some more, see if you get better if you don't try something else, right? That's, that's most writing advice. So why am I here standing on the stage? In fact, it gets even kind of a little bit worse than that because um, writers will give you contradictory advice all the time. You guys had this? Some of you are nodding, right? You will read a how to write book from a famous writer like uh, Stephen King's On Writing is a fantastic writing book, right? You will read this and he will talk about what you do to become a writer, what he did to become a writer. You'll be like, wow, I be guess I better do that. And then you'll read a different book from someone else and they'll be like, mm, do it this way. And it's completely different. Um, I often use an example of this being uh, discovery writing versus outline writing. Uh, writers tend to fall into two general camps. Um, and really, it's a spectrum that you follow along somewhere. Um, the two general camps tend to be uh, what uh, George Martin uses the term gardener, a discovery writer. I really like the term gardener. What a gardener does is a gardener starts a story with an interesting premise or some interesting characters. And they just explore their story as they start writing. And then they just kind of go wherever their whims take them. Um, George Martin is a gardener. Uh, pretty famously. Stephen King is probably the most famous gardener out there. Uh, they do not use an outline. For a lot of gardeners, if you have an outline and you work really uh, a lot on your outline, what happens is your brain feels like you've already written the story. You lose all excitement for working on the story and you get bored of it as soon as you start. Now on the other side are what George calls architects. Another term I really like. Um, an architect is someone who writes way better if they have a structure to hang their story on. Architects tend to work better in this way because what you can, they can do is they can outline a whole bunch of stuff up front. 
And then when they're working on a given chapter, they don't have to worry about all the other stuff because they've already fixed that. They can focus in on this one chapter and do this one chapter the way that they want to. Um, the secret is even the architects are discovery writing. They're just doing it in smaller jumps, right? The architect is leaping between two bullet points rather than a, you know, into the complete unknown. But architects tend to hate revision. Um, architects tend to do way better with a structured outline. But these two are kind of opposites at their extremes. Doesn't mean you can't be a hybrid, but if you're the type of person that if making an outline ruins the process for you and destroys your ability to keep writing, then you can't follow the advice that I have read multiple times from authors that say, you must have an outline, right? So what do you do? Well, you have to learn when to ignore me, right? Me representing all the people giving you advice about your writing. You have to understand that writing is really individual. And there is no right way to write a book. There can be a lot of wrong ways for you. But there, and there can be multiple right ways for you. That's part of the fun of writing. In fact, most writers use a different combination of discovery writer and outline writer tactics depending on the book that they're writing at the moment. Um, and they tend to evolve and change the more they come to understand their own process and the longer they go in their career. Um, and so really this whole outline writer versus discovery writer thing is a false dichotomy. It, but it's a model we use to discuss how a lot of writers work and what might help you. You have to learn that whenever someone gives you writing advice, they are saying, for me, this is what works. For me, I have found this experience makes me write stories that I like. You have to be willing to say, all right, maybe I'll try that. I'll give it a go and see what happens. And treat these things all like tools in your toolbox to help you write better stories. And if it doesn't work, you got to be willing to throw it away. Now, maybe not throw it all the way away. Maybe put it in that toolbox, right? and uh, be ready to grab it later on when you change in your career. Uh, but you have to be willing to understand that all of these writing modes, these models, these things, this is just all stuff that we come up with to try to explain what we're doing and to help us with problems. So another thing I'd like you to understand, a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about in this class is the sort of thing that writers, professional writers, start doing by instinct rather than stuff that we always follow exactly to the T every time. What do I mean by this? I mean, uh, let me explain using a Magic the Gathering metaphor. <laughs> we are in a sci-fi writing class, right? Um, I once heard a professional Magic the Gathering player, which is my nerd obsession, right, talk about how they got better as a Magic player. What they said is, when they first started playing, there were so many little complex minutia about certain things in the game that they had to focus on those little things, just to make sure they weren't making mistakes. The further they got playing, the more they realized that by focusing on things, they'd started to do those things by instinct. And that they then had brain space to start focusing on higher level and higher level and different tactics in playing the game. And what really happened is someone became professional as a Magic player was that they moved through doing more and more by instinct and having more and more space in their brain to focus on different parts of playing the game. I think this absolutely is true for writing as well. I feel that the more I've written, the more by instinct I've been able to you know, do simple things, such as cut the passive voice from my writing while I'm just writing a rough draft. The more I've been able to, by instinct, understand the pacing in this chapter is too slow, I need to speed it up either by trimming up here or by making you know, the, uh, this next part come faster or by putting something in the middle that gives us some sense of progress. You start doing these things by instinct and what you can start doing is then thinking about bigger and bigger and more important and well, more important is the wrong term, but different things to improve your writing. And so what you're going to be doing as a writer is you are going to, by practicing, you are going to start Basically, sticking stuff into you know, your instinct, your, uh, 
your, uh, your long-term memory rather than your RAM? I don't know. Computer people, help me out. Um, the, you're you're going you're to put this in your BIOS? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not computers. Um, you're going to, don't worry about it. We, they get it. They get it. Um, but you're going to be able to, to focus on different things as you start writing, and other things will come to you by instinct. This is why the single best thing you can do to be a better writer is make good habits for writing consistently. Now, let's put an asterisk on that, because what does writing consistently mean? It's going to mean a different thing for almost every person in this class, like I talked about earlier, right? Um, so for some writers, writing consistently means working on their outline every day for eight months and then spending four months working 12-hour days on their book, completely binge writing it and being done. I know people that that is their way of working, and every year consistently that's what they do. They write their book in four months after spending eight months fiddling with an outline. Um, I know other people who are more like myself, this is what I do, who get up and they write two to 3,000 words every day. I do it in two four-hour sessions. Uh, every day, very consistently, build you know, a castle one brick at a time, just keep on going. That is my method. Uh, for other people who are working day jobs, they're like, that's a luxury, Brandon. I don't get to do that. What I get to do is I get to spend my lunch hour working on whatever outline I'm going to write for that day. And then when I get home, I have one hour after the kids go to bed <clears throat> that I can work on my story. Um, and other people will be like, I can't even do that. Four hours on a Saturday, that's, you know, that's my, my best I can manage, four hours a week. This is going to be different for each of you. But the goal is consistency, right? Your average writer writes somewhere between 300 and 700 words an hour when they're working on, uh, on new prose. Uh, if you fall a little under or a little above this, no problem. Everybody's different. But your average writer is going to be in there somewhere, with 500 words kind of being what a lot of people can do in an hour's work. That goes way up, by the way, if you spend a whole week thinking about what this awesome scene you're going to write is, and then you only get one hour to write it, and you zip out 1,500 or 2,000 words for that one hour. Um, I've had times in my life where that's where I had to be. Um, but on average, 500 words an hour. That means that if you can find four hours a week, you can write 2,000 words. Your average novel is around 100,000 words. That's actually a little long for your average novel, which means that one year you're going to write a book if you can only find four hours a week, one four-hour session on a Saturday. If you can't find that, but you can get two hours a week, you can write a book in two years. Two years is a perfectly acceptable pace for doing that. Um, so consistency is going to trump binge writing a lot of the time, but asterisks, if you're naturally a binge writer, then you should learn to work with that and try something else because it might be easier another way, but if it doesn't, then embrace this is how you write and figure out a way to make your schedule work for that. Uh, works really well for teachers <coughs> because uh, a lot of writing, lo writing is one of these jobs that's very hard to do if you have another job that takes a lot of your brain space. A lot of people ask, what are the perfect jobs to get while I'm waiting to be a, uh, a writer? And I say, I don't know what the perfect job is for you, but I can name a couple of them you probably don't want to do. One is be a computer programmer. Um, uh, I took one computer programming class in college at BYU 20 something years ago. Um, and it was really instructive in that it was the only class that I would do my homework for. And then I would sit down to write and feel like I couldn't write because I had always already spent all this time and energy on writing code and it felt like the same sort of thing. Your mileage may vary. It may be very different for you. You might be like, you know what? I'm naturally a better writer because I, I write code. For me, writing code exhausted me for writing stories. Uh, being a teacher is another one I hear from a lot of people, that because being a teacher is one of those jobs you don't leave when you leave school, that it's, you're always work thinking about the students, thinking about the papers. This can make it really hard to be a writer. Uh, what tends to be really good is like laying bricks. And no one tells you this in, in college. They're like, oh, yeah, go get an English degree and get an English major job. 
when really going and laying bricks tends to be a really good job for a writer because you can put on headphones, listen to music, and go through your plot outline or what you're going to write that day, and then go home and be relaxed and sit in a chair and write it. Um, and menial labor tends to actually be really great for writers for that reason. Kind of bizarre and inverse of what you would, uh, you would think. Um, most of us you know, don't have that luxury in that um, uh, the luxury of becoming a, uh, a bricklayer. Um, <coughs> maybe I shouldn't phrase it that way. Um, but most of us um, in a college setting need to major in something that then is going to lead to some sort of career similar to what they're majoring in. And I get that. Uh, most English majors are going to go get a tech writing uh, job or a copy editing job or something completely unrelated to, to English because it's one of those generic degrees. But I had a lot of friends who became tech writers and they still were able to write their story. So it's not like it's going to ruin you if you're like, I have, I'm three and a half years into a computer science degree, Brandon. Um, <laughs> totally can work. I, I, have, I have code monkey friends who write books. I'm just saying, you know, the, it's, uh, it's going to vary for each person, but this is what I found. Um, I worked a graveyard shift at a hotel. Um, I, uh, I wrote, wrote from uh, 11 p.m. until 5 a.m. every day, and that's how I wrote books while I was going to school full time and working full time. Um, that I had quite the luxury in that. And you wouldn't think a minimum wage, wage job is a luxury, but having the privilege that I could just get a minimum wage job and I didn't have to worry about my finances, that that was OK. Uh, I, was in a, I was really lucky and fortunate that I was in a position where I could work for six bucks an hour. Uh, that was enough to cover all my expenses, and I could write books at work. Um, so uh, most people can't do that, right? You can't just go give up your entire social life, um, swap your sleep schedule, and uh, work a minimum wage job in order to become a writer. Um, worked for me. Um, but, you know, maybe do as I say, not as I did. Um, in this case, where are we going with this? You're going to have to figure out what works for you. But if you can be consistent, if you can learn how to do that, then you can make writing a professional endeavor for you, even if you aren't intending to go pro or if you never do go pro. So let's take a moment and talk just a little bit about this whole day is going to just be orientation stuff. Um, we'll talk about random things like this. I'll probably dig into the whole uh, discovery writer versus uh, uh, outline writer a little bit more um, so that you understand uh, kind of how the class is going to go. Um, but before that, let's talk a little bit about being a writer and having a real life, right? Um, I think it's important to have a real life. Uh, we presume that we're going to be writing about people's lives and telling stories about people's experiences. And if we don't actually live our own lives, that's going to be much harder. Um, I, I, I talk about this because the first day of class 20 years ago when Dave taught this class, one of the things he said that stuck with me all this time is he said, I have a lot of friends who say, oh, you shouldn't get married. You shouldn't have a family that will distract you from your calling as a writer. Um, I haven't had that told to me a lot. I may maybe move in different circles, but I have heard it, it happening. Um, and Dave said, I have found that having a family and, um, has just given me way more to write about than if I hadn't. Um, but there are some things I want to talk about with this that, to kind of help you guys as writers to understand this. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest division points I've found in relationships among my writer friends, and this happens kind of unexpectedly, is that the more consumed you become with your writing, the more other people in your life might feel like they are being left out of something that is all consuming and passionate for you. Uh, and this is a real issue, particularly with me up here saying, you ideally want to try to write every day for an hour or two, right? Uh, ideally, if you want to be doing this professionally in 10 years, you want to jumpstart that by writing two hours every day for the next 10 years. Um, finding two extra hours every day can be rough, particularly if you have any kind of social life. Um, not everyone can be like me, working a graveyard shift and having no social life. Um, what happens is, with a lot of um, my friends, and this actually, I noticed this. I'll, let me tell you it through the eyes of my wife. Um, 
Emily and I got married in 2006. So it was, she didn't have to suffer through all of the working a graveyard shift stuff. Um, but she also didn't have to deal with Brandon the superstar. She could just meet Brandon the uh, wannabe new writer. Um, and uh, Emily and I, like, she came from the English major world. She was an English teacher, and I was a writer and a sometimes professor at BYU. And so we were quite the good match, and we had a lot of interests in common. Uh, we, we get along really well. Um, but I can still remember one time where I went out to dinner with, uh, with Brandon Mull um, and Shannon Hale, and we were all out at dinner together, um, and we were all chatting, and it was like this wonderful dinner, right? Um, <coughs> connecting really well with these other authors. Um, it was one of the early ones before I knew uh, Mull really well, um, and it was really fun to get to know him, this person that people get bringing me his books on accident to sign. <laughs> And we both are like, when a kid does that, we're like, ah, we should probably just sign it anyway, right? <laughs> like, uh, the poor kid would be like, yeah, mole, M-U-L. Um, we don't do that. We, we usually will sign each other's books and be like, I'm the wrong Brandon, but I'm still going to sign your book because you waited all this time. Um, but, um, <sighs> by the way, okay, you get, get lots of asides in this class. I thought I was, like, when I grew up in Nebraska, I was the only Brandon, like, in my school. It was a really original, interesting name. I'm like, my parents came up with this great, original, interesting name. And then I moved to Utah to go to BYU, and there were five in my freshman dorm. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, it's a Mormon name. <laughs> Who would have thought? It's not in any, any of the scriptures, but it totally is a Mormon name. There's a ton. Brandon Flowers, right? Brandon Mull, Brandon Sanderson. Hey, there's a lot of Brandons out there who, uh, with an LDS background. So, uh, who knew? Um, but anyway, I'm out to dinner with Mull and with, uh, with Shannon, and we're chatting, and it's really great. We're sharing ideas about our writing and stuff like that. And after the dinner, um, it was at, by the way, Mama Chews. You guys like Mama Chews? Thumbs up. Um, after the dinner, I turned to Emily and said, wasn't that the best dinner ever? And she's like, you didn't look at me one time the entire dinner. I just sat there and felt invisible. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? And you're like, ah. <laughs> uh, early in our marriage. I'm better now. I'm way better now. Um, but this is a real thing that I've come to find happens that because the writers kind of get into their worlds and they are doing this thing that is like really cool. Writing is really cool. It's like this, this you know, I don't like to get too mystical about it, but you got a blank page and you make something out of that and then it's like what's in your brain and then someone else reads it and they imagine something pretty similar to that. It's like you can, you can write things and people across the world from completely different backgrounds can imagine the thing that you've written and you've got a connection with someone um, that is completely different from you that you've never met. It's really cool. Um, it's really it's just this purely creative thing where you, you're doing, taking nothing and making something from it. I love it. Um, but you can get so invested in that that the people in your lives feel really left out, right? Uh, so I'm going to give you this warning kind of at the beginning of the class. I'm going to, as a writer, you know, push you to write a lot, but I'm going to suggest that you also learn how to balance your life because it's very easy to burn out as a writer. It's very easy to become so consumed by this that it destroys aspects of your life. Um, the thing that I've done, this is again just one of these tools to try, is that I started realizing that when I was with my family, I needed to be with my family. And this was a hard transition for me because I got married in my 30s, right? I had spent a lot of time learning to be a writer, and one of the things you learn to do as a writer, particularly one who has to work full time and go to school full time, is that you start to look for those moments when no one is asking you to do anything, and you use those to work on your stories, right? You carry around a notebook, you carry around your phone, you uh, start, you know, writers don't get bored, which is great. People are like, oh, you were left alone by yourself waiting for me to show up for a half hour, I'm so sorry. And you're like, it was the only half hour that no one bugged me all day, I got so much work done, um, <laughs> even though it was all up here. Um, I started to use driving time. It was great for this, right? Something about being about moving um, while like you're going and thinking is just really handy for coming up with ideas. This is why, by the way, Kevin J. Anderson, aside, he goes on hikes and dictates all his books on hikes. Um, and then, yeah, he, he uses completely dictation software so he can be moving when he's writing. 
Um, um, yeah, the, he, I, I know other people have tried it and it actually works for them. It's never worked for me because I don't think with words the same way, that, uh, with spoken word the same way I do on the page, but I might be able to train myself if I really wanted to. But anyway, I was using all these moments. And so when I was driving somewhere, my wife would say, I know when you're thinking about a story because if I say something, you jolt and you look at me like, what have you just done? I was in Roshar and it was cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> Now I'm in a minivan. <laughs> Where is my Spren? Um, uh, and I started to realize this could take over everything. And if instead I started putting boundaries in place to contain um, you know, the imagination and then be with my family when I was supposed to be with my family, my life would be better. And so at 5.30, I am not allowed to work on books from 5.30 until 9. Doesn't matter if I have free time, right? Doesn't matter if the family's away or something like that. I have this barrier in place, and it's been so good for my life because it's also good to kind of step out into the real world. People accuse us of living in fantasy worlds. They don't understand, right? We're not living in fantasy worlds. We don't lose track of the real world. It's not like, you know, we're all these, these people who are uh, schizophrenic and can't tell the difference between hallucinations and reality, right? That is not what it is. People always say that, and it always bugs me, because that's not what it is. I am constructing something. I'm building something. It's really engaging. It's really fulfilling, but it's not like I'm forgetting where, you know, what I, the world I live in um, and things like that. Um, even if, when you interrupt me, I look like I'm really annoyed, because I kind of am really annoyed, because I was making a really cool connection between, uh, you know, two different parts of my story. Um, that barrier lets me step out, go to the, uh, you know, live my life as it should be lived, um, interacting with other people, and it makes me that much more refreshed when I go back to writing. Uh, this is why I do two sessions, by the way, partially because I don't want to get up in the morning, because I'm a writer, right? <laughs> I didn't do this job to get up at 8 a.m. Um, so I get up at noon, right? <laughs> and then people are always asking me about it, and they're like, oh, you learned that while you were working at the graveyard shift. And I'm like, that's right. I did all those years at the graveyard shift, and it has changed me, and so now I have to suffer and live with this whole off schedule. No, 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 I was like this before the graveyard shift, right? <laughs> Um, I've always wanted, I like, I like being up at night. Um, people leave me alone. Um, so I, but doing two sessions for me, um, from about one until five, and then about 10 until two, is great for my writing, because I have that time in between that just refreshes and relaxes me, right? I get to go do something else, and then when I sit back down to write, I'm excited to do it again uh, for another four-hour session. Um, so I recommend finding and at least understanding the, what this can do to the relationships in your life and taking some steps, they don't have to be the steps I took, to make sure that it doesn't consume you to the point that it ruins your ability to have good relationships. Um, on the flip side, here are some tips you can give to a spouse or roommates um, that you can talk about with them to help them understand because what one thing that people don't generally understand about most writers, again, writers are different, so everyone's different. Most writers takes us a little time to get into it. I don't know if this is the case for you, but you sit down with your laptop, and if you were to time yourself, that first, for me, that first hour, that's not a 500 word an hour hour. That's like a 200 words, right? And then that third hour is like a thousand words in an hour. And then like the fourth hour, I'm starting to run out of steam, and it's like an average one, and the one in between is like an average one, right? And so if I get interrupted for 15 minutes after I've spent 45 minutes like really getting it going, what it does is it can reset me back to the first hour, the 200-word thing. And so what my wife didn't understand, and I didn't even understand at the time, is that a 5 to 15-minute interruption can mean more like a 45 minute delay in me getting to that zone where the writing's really working for me. And learning that, if, that's, if you're the case, this is the case for you, and being able to explain this block of time, whatever it is, is so precious because it's only at the middle where it will really start coming and working for me. And if you can get your friends and family 
to be the guardians of that time so that they have a part in it. So you're like, these two hours, make sure no one interrupts me. And then I will be with you after I have done those two hours because I'll, I will be so much more relaxed that I've gotten my writing done. My wife has learned this. She's like, wow, if he gets his writing done, everything is great. But if he doesn't get his writing done multiple times, uh, days in a row, he starts to get really anxious. And she will tell people, Brandon hasn't gotten, been able to write in a couple of days. Give him some space, right? Um, <clears throat> um, and this is why tours are, uh, can be miserable uh, in part. Um, but, you know, p giving her that sort of connection to the writing, uh, letting her in to the brainstorming when I talk about, oh, you know, I made this cool connection. Isn't this cool? Um, has been really helpful for our relationship and for my career in multiple ways. She's really good at guarding my time. She makes sure that I don't get interrupted. And in exchange, when um, not only, you know, best-selling books are really good for marriages because you, you don't have to worry if the, when the money is coming in. If the books aren't selling, it's bad for marriages. Um, uh, you know, because it can be all the stress. So there's that, but there's also the, the idea that we're together on this and we have a shared goal and a shared focus. Uh, let me ask, before I kind of do some stuff on the board just about uh, discovery writing, it's not actually stuff on the board, you'll uh, understand in a minute. Um, any questions about what I've talked about here, about writing life, about becoming professional and tr how you're treating this? Yeah, go ahead. How do I overcome the sense of despair that you're not going to be able to uh, make it? So this comes from a couple of places for me, um, or did back in the days, because you know I spent a lot of time not making it until I did. Um, one was Pandora's box, right? It always, I still had hope. It could always happen. Um, there are a lot of writers who toil in obscurity for a long time and then eventually sell. Don't let anyone tell you that if you haven't made it in, your, in, in 10 years that you just will never make it. Go ask George R. R. Martin what people said to him when he was a mid-lister for 30 years and barely was able to get people to read his books for a long time writing great books and then suddenly he became the best-selling fantasy author in the world, right? Um, and so, yeah, there is that hope, right? You can always still make it. Um, another is, for me, learning to focus on, am I satisfied with the writing? Am I proud of what I've done? Um, and making sure that I am, because it's a real achievement to finish things. Um, I meet a lot of people who want to be writers. Uh, this class excluded, you want to bet what percentage of them actually finish a novel? Not very many. If you finish a novel, you are in a more select crowd than the select crowd between people who have finished a novel and gotten published, right? The, the, the cutoff percentage, uh, the fall off percentage of people who never finish a novel is much larger than the fall off between those who finish a novel and get published. And so if you finish a novel, you are already in a more select crowd. The most select crowd you can probably be in as a writer if you're looking at pure divisions of numbers, right? Um, pure drop offs between achieving certain goals. Um, so be proud of the fact that you're finishing things. And if you're not, we're going to work in this class on learning how to, OK? Because that you have power over. Focus on what you have power over. You have power over whether you finish your stories. You have power over whether you're consistent. You have power over whether you, know, you are excited and interested in the stories you're creating. You do not have as much power over whether you're going to make it or not. Um, that helped me a great deal. Um, another thing is to be exploring other options, right? Uh, Self-publishing is a real thing. It's possible that you are totally of professional quality in your writing, and you just haven't found an editor who's willing to give the books a chance, and you belong in self-publishing as an indie author. Um, it's also possible that you write things that are so esoteric that you have a small potential fan base, but you can be satisfied that you are writing great books for them, and you are publishing the books for them, and you find a job adjacent to being a uh, novelist that is still really fulfilling to you. I mean, there are a lot of things to do, and none of them are things like, none of them are going to take away 
that despair entirely, right? Because there's a part of you that's like, I should be, you know, selling these books. These are really good books. Or depending on your psychology, my books are terrible. I am terrible. What am I doing? There, that's equally likely. And you know, um, that one's more pernicious. Let's uh, let's point that out. It is probably wrong. Um, but um, yeah, that's what I did. Ask other people. Ask other writers. Make sure you're part of the community. Um, and things like that, because that can help. I got published because Dan Wells met an editor at a convention who um, the editor uh, turned out to be a really good match for me and an only mediocre match for Dan. And Dan introduced me to the editor, and the editor bought my book, right? Like, having connections with other writers can be really handy. Um, what other questions you guys got? Uh, anything you want to throw at me? Yeah, over here. How do you get into that writing community? Well, you are in the right place. Uh, because um, after I talk about this next little thing for just a little bit, we're going to split into writing groups. Um, and that's part of this class. And we're going to talk about how to do writing groups and stuff like that. Um, so actually, you know what? We've only got 15 minutes left. Let's move on to that portion. Uh, I'll talk more about discovery writers and things another day. Uh, let's talk about writing groups. So uh, for this class, I'm going to require the people who are in the 15-person uh, session. Uh, you know who you are. You've already applied and gotten in. Uh, we will go and chat um, in private um, uh, after this. That's the class I go to after this. For those who don't know, there's a one uh, fifth hour and 15-minute lecture. And then I take 15 writers who have applied ahead of time and who have gotten in. They're chosen by uh, Karen, my continuity editor, because I don't have time to do it anymore um, from the applications. And then we, ta we do a writing group. We do a workshop. Um, and so taking this class puts, gives you a leg up for if you want to apply to that one. I will warn you, there's a lot more required of that class than this one. This one, you show up, I give you an A. That one, you're going to have to write a bunch. We're gonna have, that's like you pretend for a semester you're a professional writer, um, and you're writing as much as that is. And you have to learn to juggle that with all the other things in your life. Um, and it's training for that. So. That class, I mean, uh, I require 30,000 words is what I think we came up with, 35,000. 35,000 words in a semester. None of your other writing classes will ever require that much. I remember when I took a 518 class at BYU, and they're like, you're going to have to submit twice. And both submissions have to be 2,000 words. <laughs> and half the class was like, oh, no, how will I have that ready? Um, I'm like, seriously? Uh, that's an afternoon, um, right? Um, but um, so 35K. So I'm going to require them to be in a writing group. The rest of you I will not require to be in a writing group. Um, but I will explain how you do writing groups, and I will give the, uh, you the opportunity to split into writing groups um, to get practice. Now, here's the thing writing groups are also a tool that work for some people and not other ones. Part of the reason I force um, the class to do it. This, the 15 person classes, I want them to give it a good, uh, pun intended, college try at having a writing group. Because if a writing group works, it is one of the most useful tools for you in your writing career. Um, I am still in a writing group with the people I formed a writing group from in this class 20 years ago. Okay? Um, Dan's not in it anymore because he moved to North, uh, North Salt Lake and he doesn't want to drive. Um, <laughs> but the other people are still in the group with me, and they are the most useful group of, uh, of you know, people for bouncing ideas against and things like that that I have ever had. And when Dan, you know, Dan was in the group, he got me published, right? Peter's in the group. Peter went off and became a professional editor, and then I finally hired him away when I needed a, an editorial director at my company. Um, and he is just invaluable, right? And so meeting these people in this class was they, they were all in the class with me, and they were all still together, uh, was super, super relevant. But let me give you the dark side of writing groups, OK? Dark side of writing groups. One really dark side of writing groups is particularly newer writers don't know how to workshop. And one of the things they'll try to do is they'll try to make your story into the story they would write instead of a better version of the story you want to write. And that is the single worst thing 
that can happen in feedback is someone who is not appreciating the story you want to make and they want to turn it into something else. And new workshoppers are really bad at doing this. In other words, they're really good at doing a bad thing, which is trying to, and they're doing it from the goodness of their heart. They want you to be a better writer. They want to help you. And the only way they know is to tell you how they would do it, which can be completely wrong for your story, right? Uh, this is extra dangerous if you are by nature more of a discovery writer. If you, have, if you don't think about your story ahead of time, if you're not working from an outline, someone can come to you and say, man, it'd be so much better if you did this. And you're like, my story needs to have that. It was a romance, but n now it needs a mystery, um, <laughs> right? And the next, next week, someone says, oh, you know what, you know, if I were doing this, I'd make sure there were vampires. And you're like, that's right, romances have vampires these days. <laughs> I'd better write vampires into it. I mean, it was happening, you know, it was completely not a vampire story. It was a, it was a regency, but now it's got vampires. And, um, and then someone else is like, well, I don't really like stories with female protagonists. And like, well, I'll change the gender um, so that everyone, like, you can just go completely spiral out of control um, with people giving you feedback and you taking it too sincerely. Um, now. The good side of writing groups. Good side of writing groups is they can be a really great support structure. Before you get published, having a goal and a deadline for submitting is really helpful. And it's OK to have to have a deadline in order to submit. You don't have to be like, we all have different psychology. Some of us need a deadline. And so you can create one for yourself, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so. Having a deadline, having a support group of people who are going through the same things you're going through. Um, also, you know, of people who are likely to give you good feedback, a writing group that has been working with you for a while are the types of people who will learn, hopefully, your writing style, learn to like what you're doing, and they will be much better at giving you advice on making, you the, making the story the way you want to make it after they get to know you and things like this. So you can cultivate a group who eventually will give you good feedback, even if their feedback at the start is not that great. Um, so a couple of guidelines for writing groups, OK? So um, if you, I assume that this light turns on. This is new from last year. Uh, we stood up here like, um, like apes banging, uh, um, banging stones against it for a while and couldn't figure it out. Um, I might have my AV guy come and try and figure it out. So eventually, maybe we'll have a light up here. So until then, I won't write in the shadow. Um, so if you are a workshop-er uh, uh, giving advice, right? Here's a few points to give you. Try to be descriptive of your emotions, not proscriptive. Right? OK. Try to be descriptive. What this means is, for particularly when you're newer at this, saying, I was bored, completely valid. There's never a time when I was bored is not a valid response to something you were bored by. Saying, you should add a fight scene can be really bad advice. Sometimes it can be good advice. If you really know the person and know the thing and you know the subgenre and what the writer's trying to do, you could be like, I feel like a fight right here would really you know, snap things together. But it can be bad advice. I was bored can never be bad, at, uh, bad advice, right? It's always valid. Your response to the story always is. Now, the reader, the, um, the, the workshop E, does not need to take that. They can understand, well, maybe you're supposed to be bored. Or maybe this book isn't connecting with, and clicking with you, and it's OK because someone else, that's their favorite scene. Um, there are lots of reasons to not take that advice, but that response is always valid. Saying, I'm confused, always valid. Doesn't matter like if you miss something, it's, it's, it's OK to miss things. The reader, writer needs to know if you've missed stuff. They may not have made it clear. Maybe you just missed it. Maybe your kids were crying, or maybe your roommates were doing a raid, or whatever it is that people do. Um, and you know, they're like, there's like a Pokemon that everyone needs to catch, and you're trying to read while they're all catching their Pokemon. Um, and like you missed it. Um, and nothing needs to change. But it's not invalid that you were confused. Let them know you're confused. Um, be descriptive rather than proscriptive. 
Uh, this comes from, you know, it's this great thing Hollywood does. I heard about, and I've loved it ever since. They do this test um, audience thing for a bunch of uh, sitcoms, and they will get an audience together, show them the sitcoms, and then afterward, ask them questions, and the questions are all about the advertisements because it's not really a test audience for the uh, sitcoms. They use the same like three uh, test sitcoms that never expected to be aired. They want to get your reaction to the ads, and they don't want to tell you that up front because they want to get your natural reaction. That's what the writer needs from you. They need your natural reaction as if you didn't know you were going to be giving feedback on this, just reading it and giving them the feedback so that they can be like, oh, that's what I wanted, or oh, I was totally surprised by that, all right? So if you're the workshopee, right? If you're the workshopee, write it down, and don't change anything yet. That's what that says, if you can't read it, my handwriting. Um, somewhere, Mrs. Sukup, my second grade teacher, is shaking her head because she trained a best-selling author, and she warned him his handwriting was bad, and she was not able to save him. Um, <laughs> um, if you're the workshopee, write it down, but don't change anything yet. Give it some time. Give it some space. Uh, listen to the feedback, and... Um, Try to understand, right? Try to get where they're coming from and understand if that's a reaction you want. Sometimes you want people to be a little confused. Sometimes you want them to want something they haven't gotten yet because you're going to give it to them in a few chapters. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe they're having a you've done something wrong. They're having a complete wrong reaction. They're all laughing at this thing that you thought was really serious. Really important for you to know, but Stay silent. Unlike whatever it is over there making noise. Um, <laughs> this is good advice, particularly when you're new. Don't say anything. Pretend you're a fly on the wall and that they're all sitting around having a book club discussion of the book and you're just writing stuff down. Prevent yourself from defending yourself. Prevent yourself from explaining. If you defend yourself, it's just going to make people less likely to give you feedback in the future. If you explain it, then it de defeats your chance to explain it right in the writing and have them get it, and you won't know if you are able to get them to understand it through your writing because you've already explained it and tainted them. All right? Uh, one more thing for the workshopper. Be sure to say what is good. All right, the um, way we do my workshop is we start and we make everyone say what is working up front so the writer doesn't accidentally change the things that are working. Plus, it's really good for you to get told what is working and that your writing doesn't suck before everyone launches into telling you how terrible your writing is, right? <laughs> so um, we do a few minutes of that, and then we transition to things that could use a second look is what we call it in my writing group. It's not things that are broken. It's just you know, things that the reader felt, things that they want to highlight that you may want to have a second look at, stuff like that, all right? Um, I think you guys are going to enjoy the class. I'll warn you, it's kind of like a fire hose thing where I just talk a whole bunch. I try to make it entertaining, but if you fall asleep, I won't be offended. Um, this is for you. Uh, come with questions because I will try to give lots of Q&A uh, periods where we can talk about things that are not working or working for you. If you're interested in being in a writing group, hang out here. If you're not interested in being a writing group, why don't you go ahead and take off, and then we'll, I'll deal with the rest of you. But anyway, enjoy the class. Thanks for taking it. <laughs>